Gracie Jiu Jitsu rocks. Welcome to the Gracie Jiu Jitsu Rocks podcast, a podcast dedicated to Gracie Jiu Jitsu and all things Gracie, including self defense, competition, anti bullying, women's self defense and empowerment nutrition, and most especially, the people involved in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. This podcast is for the average Joe. It's for anyone who practices, trains, teaches, or just loves to talk about or hear about Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. We'll explore the lives of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu practitioners, how they got involved in the art, and what effect it's had on their lives. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to episode 125 of the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Rocks podcast. As always, I'm your host, Marty Josie, and thanks for listening. Very excited about today's episode because my guest is Ricky Lundell. And for those of you who don't know, Ricky Lundell is an incredibly accomplished grappler. He was the Fila and Pancration World Champion, World BJJ Champion. He was a D1 collegiate wrestler. He's also been a world-renowned MMA coach, working with some of the UFC elites like John Jones, Ronda Rousey, Frank Mir, Misha Tate, and others. He's a fourth-degree jiu-jitsu black belt under Master Pedro Sauer, and at age 19, received his black belt under Master Sauer and became the youngest person to receive a Gracie jiu-jitsu black belt in the United States. He was voted... Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Instructor of the Year from 2012 to 2017, and today he's a prominent coach, trainer, and motivational speaker, and is founder of a movement called 1% Better Every Day. And in this interview, he covers a lot of ground, uh, his years growing up and his time with Master Sauer, his various grappling events and winning world championships in several different grappling arts and organizations. His time as a collegiate wrestler working with the legendary wrestling coaches Kale and Cody Sanderson. How he got into working with the UFC's elite fighters and much more. He also talks about the uh, the 1% each day movement and how that got started. And just a really, really great interview. Before interviewing Ricky, I was already quite a fan, but I came away from it uh, with just so much more respect for him. And He's accomplished so much, uh, even at such a young age. He's still only in his 30s, uh, early 30s. So just a terrific guy all around. I know you're going to really enjoy this interview. After the interview, stay tuned for the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. And now, without further ado, let's talk to Ricky. All right, I'm speaking with Ricky Lundell, world Fila and Pancration champion, world BJJ champion, D1 wrestler, world-renowned MMA coach, and fourth-degree jiu-jitsu black belt. So welcome, Ricky. It's truly an honor to be speaking with you today, buddy. Marty, it's a pleasure to be on your show. I'm glad that we could make the time and get together. Absolutely. Absolutely. My honor. So, you know, you've done so much, Ricky, over your career, starting at a very young age, and I want to make sure we cover all aspects of, of your accomplishments. So to get us going, if you would, just uh, start by sharing with us how you got started in jiu-jitsu. I think it was like age six or something, wasn't it? Yeah, I was six years old, and um, back in, back in uh, this was in 1992, so it was a year before the first UFC came to light. And uh, I, was at a, I, was, I was attending a private school at the time in, in Utah that was very small, you know, maybe 20 kids in it. It was more like a daycare private schooling setup. And Pedro Sauer had come to, to Utah from, from Torrance. So there was only two Gracie schools in the entire United States at the time. There was, there was Torrance. And then Pedro Sauer had just that day opened up his first jiu-jitsu school in Utah. And uh, he had two daughters at the time. 
And he somehow, with limited Portuguese, showed up to the school and talked the principal into letting him take the kids out on on the recess field and show us some jujitsu. So Pedro Sauer at the time he he spoke he he spoke just one thing he knew how to say at this time was do like this <laughs> do like this and he, he would he came out and then oh he knew one other word fight wow. fight so Pedro Sauer who was who's been my professor since I was six years old now he uh, he sits us down in a circle on the field. And he had his daughter, Thaisa, with him. And Thaisa was a yellow belt in jiu-jitsu at the time. And she was a little pit bull. Like, uh, her body style, she was just strong. And she's, she's just stocky and just muscle, right? And his other daughter, Priscilla, uh, she was lengthier, a little taller, you know, thinner. But unbelievable in jiu-jitsu. I mean, both of his daughters were just phenomenal. And so uh, we're sitting on the field, and at that time, I mean, Chuck Norris was huge. Steven Seagal was huge. Uh, I mean, Van Damme, Jackie Chan, like, America was all about karate. I mean, it was karate, karate, karate. And my father was a, he was an Ishimaru black belt and a Kenpo karate black belt. And uh, he, had, he had limited wrestling, limited groundwork, but he had great stand-up. And so he practiced with me in Ishinru and Kenpo Karate. And so we had, we had been doing karate for a while. So <laughs> Professor Sauer, we're out in this field, and he says, he says who, who thinks that, you know, like he's like trying to, trying to set up a thing. He says, fight Haisa. And I'm like sitting there, and there's like a group of us all sitting there and in, in a little like polo shirt, <laughs> fight Thaisa. So I raise my hand, like, oh man, I could beat this girl, you know, like little girl, <laughs> right? For sure. And I can't believe it. Like I get to do like Power Rangers right out here at school. This is phenomenal. We're gonna do this whole fight scene. So I get up, get in a fighting stance, and Professor Sauer says, fight. <laughs> Right there in the middle, no gloves, no pads, no nothing. And Thais is in a gi with a little yellow belt, right? And I'm like, okay, like I'm going to get her. So I like try to throw a strike and she just shoots a shot and takes me down to the ground. So then I turn over and I'm trying to get up and she wraps up my neck in a rear naked choke and she's choking me. But I don't know how to submit because at this time, nobody knew what a, what a tap was. Nobody knew how to tap or do anything like that. So then Professor Sauer keeps being like hitting the ground and saying, tapping, tapping, tapping. So I'm like choking, like I'm thinking I'm going to cry. And I tap. She gets off of me. I'm like emotionally broken. Like all my friends just saw me lose. I, I'm <laughs> pretty sure that I'm good at karate, but I just got beat by some jujitsu person, right? And uh, that day, I talked to my, I talked to my dad right as I, right as I left. And my dad takes me immediately down to Professor Sauer school. And he signs me and my older brother up that day. And I was on the cards, you got cards. So first student, you know, Priscilla Sauer second student, Thaisa Sauer, I'm number six. Wow. And that's where it started. Wow. Incredible. <laughs> How amazing is it that he only knew those few words or phrases and was able to start building so much, right? Most, for so many people, that quote unquote limitation would have really held them back, but it sounds like he was, he was charging forward no matter what, right? Uh, Marty, his, it, Professor Sauer's motivation is, is it's on another level. I mean, he, when he had shown up to Utah, he, he got there and, you know, people go, well, why would, why would you ever go to Utah when, when you had Torrance or why would you ever show up at Utah? Well, at that, at that time period, he had two daughters. He showed up in Utah, heavily family value oriented state, 
beautiful mountains like he had never seen before. I mean, snow and just blue and green and, you know, where in Brazil it was jungle or it was metropolitan. So when he showed up, he was just like, this is so beautiful. This is so pretty. But then he couldn't speak any English. All he knows is, I mean, all he knows is fight. Where I come from, bam, get students, and then builds an empire out of this. I mean, two years after that, he was fighting Mr. Utah in, in, uh, in a super fight he had set up by a radio show. Wow. And, and he ended up submitting 250-pound Mr. Utah when he was 150 pounds. And you, any of you guys listening, you can find that online. And it was in the early days where people just didn't know what jujitsu was. It was set up as a, it was, it was really set up as style versus style. Jiu-jitsu would assimilate anything that worked. It didn't have so many lines in it like, like it does today. Back then, it, it was really the definition of MMA. Right. It was, if that strike works or if that takedown works, we're going to do it. So it was, it was a very different time. Absolutely. Yeah, it was definitely a, a different time then, um, that pure style against style. And I know a lot of people have seen that, that classic battle uh, that you described with uh, Mr. Sauer and, and the, uh, the bodybuilder, a very imposing figure. Uh, a few months ago, I was at a seminar with, with uh, Professor Sauer, and, and he, your name came up, and, and he started talking about just what a, what a phenom and prodigy you were at such an early age and just how impressive it was to watch you grow and develop through the years. So I know that's two-way mutual respect, it sounds like, for sure. Describe for us how it was just uh, from that point you were working your way on up through and how you became the youngest uh, black belt in America at 19. Oh, well, I, I got to say it was, um, you know, it's a culmination of just so many, um, so many things to make that actually come to fruition. I, I, at the time, I never would have even dreamed of being a black belt. Um, the idea of even becoming America's youngest black belt, that wasn't even a thought or on my mind. I, uh, I, I remember watching... You know, uh, so early in the stage, I remember watching a blue belt come from from Brazil or an, and a purple belt come from Brazil in 97, 98. And everybody would just be in awe. Oh, my gosh, this is a purple belt. Oh, my gosh, this is a blue belt. Like, where did these guys come from? And then one day a brown belt showed up. We just thought, wow, a, a brown belt. You know, all we had seen is, white and blues and blacks like this. This is not even a purple and a brown that exists in America. So um, the beginning stages were, were it was almost like uh, some type of pioneering. Um, you, you only really saw black belts come from Brazil. And, and nowadays, nowadays, as funny as it sounds, it's, it's, it's almost like I'm finally realizing what it was that I was around to, to be on the mat with, Hicks and Gracie or Mark Schultz. And now to, now to realize that to be in Alio Gracie's home, you know, and, and, uh, to, to train on those maps now, it, now he's gone. And so it's, it's really nostalgic to look back and see, see what was happening and how it was actually happening. Um, but I spent most, most days I just, I set up everything I could around jujitsu and, and, uh, my parents, my parents divorced and Pedro Sauer had six daughters and he took me on as a son and he just trained me and trained me and introduced me to the right people and then had me train more. And, and I loved it. I was a truth seeker and I loved anything that worked. And, um, I, I remember as I was, as I was coming up and as I was growing up, I couldn't afford I couldn't afford seminars. My dad, my dad with Pedro Sauer, he traded a an old an old tub with you know the bear claw feet. Yeah, that's that's how we paid for lessons. Wow. I uh, he he gave that to Pedro Sauer, and, and uh, Professor Sauer accepted it for for my lessons, and then I would go to Professor Sauer's house and pull weeds so that that way I could 
I could come and train and, and be on the mat. And really, I realized now he was Mr. Miyagi work ethic in me the whole time. I mean, it was just like, let me teach you through, through work. You That's know? so great, and man. It was just an unbelievable, unbelievable time. And so it started, it started very young. I remember, I remember sitting there and watching these great men from Brazil come down and professor Sauer would say, this is, this is Hoist Gracie, you know? And I would, I would be like, Oh, that's, that's awesome. He's going to be fighting next year in a, in a, in a fight show that we're putting together. And, you know, we're, we're just gonna, we're going to be training in here. And before you knew it, there's no gloves at this time. There's no, there's no protective gear. Nobody's wearing headgear. No way. And you got Hoist Gracie standing across from Professor Sauer, and they're trying to take each other down, <laughs> controlled position, kicking each other at the knee. Like, it was, it was unbelievable. Like, real MMA was going on. Nowadays, I see, you know, people got their gloves on and their tape on, and, and you know, they got, they got big glove days, small glove days, wrestling day. Back then, it was, it was everything all the time. And it was no gloves and justice and it was about it was about honor it wasn't about paydays and yeah. it was uh it, it was beautiful you know as much as i admire the modern uh version of mma there was something just so pure and raw about the how it was way back when i love having i love hearing people describe it that were there and because i was w- around way back in the first uh, ufc's when i remember them, them coming on but i like hearing from people that were already training jujitsu when the first UFC happened, because it's a whole different kind of a uh, perspective. It was a very different perspective. I, re- I remember at the time, at the time we would, we would sit back and we would talk and nowadays people would say, we would say, Hey, do you like MMA or do you like, do you like to watch MMA? Back then it was called NHB. Mm-hmm. This term has like disappeared in this world now, but that was no holds bar, and no holds bar really meant n- no holds bar. I mean, it was <laughs> you could punch the groin, you could poke in the eyes. I mean, it was unbelievable. Headbutting was totally fine. Oh yeah. Do you remember? And now <laughs> we're in this. Sorry. Do you remember when? Oh. when remember when Joe San and I think it was Keith Hackney, the fight. And oh keeps on God. top of him, like pinning him no, down by no, the neck, no. and he's just pummeling his groin <laughs> hard. <laughs> That's, that was crazy. Yes, the Joe Sando fight. Yeah. Oh my God. You're just cringing now, with every I, punch. I, I, I can't even imagine nowadays, even trying to, to get that through some type of right? legal system. Now, yeah, it would never happen. Yeah. So, so it, it is. It's amazing to talk to talk to someone else who was who was there at that time period because. It's less and less, you know, and a lot of the, a lot of the guys, you know, we all get older and the guys that are these these legendary figures um, and who who I had, I had grown up with. I mean, they're getting older and they're passing on or they're retiring and and disappearing into the into the night, you know. Absolutely. So. So going back, going back, I, I, I did a few things. And if you guys want to be if anybody listening is trying to improve their their jujitsu game or their grappling game, their wrestling game, their judo game. I, I don't really care what style it is, but I can, I can give you some insights on, on things that I did. Number one, I, I would visualize at night mm. and, um, I would sit there and my, this was big in my family, my father and my mother, though they, they, uh, couldn't always be there during my jujitsu times. They, they were very good at explaining to me that I needed to visualize and I needed to uh, understand where an opponent was without, without them actually being there. Because we're talking about a three-dimensional game. And sometimes to do a technique correctly, you actually have to look left while the person is going to the right. They're, tur- they're being thrown or they're being swept or you're going underneath left and they're going to fall to the right. Well, if you don't look th- that direction, they won't go correctly. So you have to be able to uh, know where they are in space and time without visually seeing them. So visual- visualization helped me a lot. And when you get really good at visualization, if you lay in bed and as you're going to sleep, you spend 20 minutes 
slowly visualizing the techniques. You can try to en enter into lucid dreaming where you are visualizing while you're sleeping. And that gives you more reps and more understanding of the art. And it connects the conscious brain to the subconscious brain. And that's really where you want your techniques to go is you want them to go into your long-term memory and not just sit, sit in your short-term memory. So I did that every night and I still do that every night. So that's, that's one thing that can help a lot. The second thing I did, uh, which, which <laughs> Pedro Sauer and, and everybody, they would just be like, oh my gosh, this, we told him to drill this and he just, he just drills it. Drilling, I would, I took on the triangle choke, let's say for, for two years. And what I would do is I would do a triangle and I would take, I would have a partner and he would take his hands and he could put his hands on my chest, put a hand on the floor, put a hand forward, put a hand backwards. And my job was to lock my legs around the waist. And then I would do a triangle choke from any position he put his arms. And then I, without him moving his arms, I'd have to relock my legs. So you got to re-thread your legs through and relock them. And then I would do 500 a day. Wow. And so you do that 500 times a day, every single day. And in 20 days, you're at 10,000. Well, if you do that for a year, then two years, you beyond master a technique, so you can get it from anywhere. So if, if somebody were to watch why I can do a flying triangle choke without landing and breaking my neck or a flying arm bar without landing and breaking my neck, it all started from the ground up. I did 500 techniques a day on that technique for a couple of years. And all of those techniques add up over time. I did the same thing with guillotines. And that's why I can flying arm lock or flying guillotine or flying triangle because I know where I am in space and time. And if you want to get better, you, you know, you just work to get a little bit better at it. If you did 50 or if you did 10 and it just ripped your abs up tomorrow, try to do 11. And then the next day, try to do 12. And before you know it, I could bust out about 500 in about 15 minutes, but wow. maybe 20, but you'd have to be, you just get moving and your body just knows how to do it. And, um, it's like running or cardio in any way. So those two, those two things for, for a lot of people, they might sound extreme, you know, or it might be 500 techniques a day. Are you crazy? I maybe drill it twice and then I wait for the next technique and I talk the whole time. So that's why you're not getting any better. Right. You know, that's why I, you suck. <laughs> that's why you suck. I love that. <laughs> I love both of those things. First of all, I'm a huge believer in, in visualization. Uh, I think the power of the mind is just so incredibly strong and, and it, we're only starting to understand just the the magnitude of what you can do with it so i think you i think if you're not using that in your training for whatever endeavor you're training for if you're not using the power of the mind you're definitely not doing all you can uh, so i'm glad you spoke to that the other thing is you know people are always looking for a shortcut or that what's that magic thing i can do that secret thing oh yeah and, but you describe oh, yeah. just basic hard work when you if you do 500 reps of something and drill 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 that's no secret. That's just hard work and doing it consistently. So I love that. Yeah. If you do something, you do something enough times. The key is so long, long, long time ago, uh, I was on the math and I was told, listen, I need you to do it as many times as it takes before you can't show me it wrong. Wow. Love that. And, so, and so you get into a mindset where you're, you're, you're doing triangles and you're like, oh, I messed that one up. Oh, I messed that one up. Well, at that stage, see, you're messing it up. Now, get to a place where you do a triangle and then you're trying to say, this is how you don't do it. And you're trying to figure out how to make your legs move incorrectly. That is a different place. That's yeah. a different zone. And when you drill enough, you will hit that zone. And then you can't miss in tournament. You can't miss, you can't miss in a street fight. You didn't even mean to. It's just your reaction just how your body moves so until you reach that zone and things slow down for you you're going to be in a hectic chaotic place where all you're having is an adrenaline dump and when you have an adrenaline dump you're not emotionally there you're yeah. not physically there so then you enter willpower way too early in a match and that is not the place you want to start a match that's 12th round kind of stuff we want to start our matches way back where 
things are still slow for us, where we can see they shoot as fast as they can, but it's slow for you because your body just reacts perfectly as if you were, you know, Scotty Pippen, Scotty Pippen serving it to Jordan or, or, uh, you know, Stockton and Malone. It's just, it's all about reps being repetitive and knowing where they are before they get there. Mm. And you can only do that through a lot of, a lot of repetition. So you anchor it into your nervous system so strongly that um, you don't have to think about it. You're just on autopilot. And you, and you can't do that bouncing around each session from, from trying to specialize in one thing and then another and then another, uh, skimming the surface, never digging that deep hole, right? Absolutely. You can't go lapel guard and then the next day X guard and then skip triangles for, for two weeks and then wonder why you're not good at triangles. Have you done a triangle in two weeks? Well, no, I was working on half and uh, lockdown, and then I was working on cross shows. It's like, dude, well, whatever you want to get good at, that has to be an EDD. It's an everyday drill, and you got to do it. And then you can improve other things in your repertoire. Get get little, you know, st- star spots in your game. But where where are your EDDs? Where have you placed those? What is important to you? Are you building that foundation on on something solid? techniques that are 100 percent solid if you land it it is over or are you building it on a lapel choke that you've seen only land like i don't know 20 percent of the time even when the best guy does it you got to focus on the ones that are you know high high percentage rates and then stick those right in the core of your game and make them an edd put repetitions into those don't put it into the the newest craziest trick as you said earlier the shortcut move Forget that. Get to the core. That'll save you a lot of time. Get to the core. I love it. I love it. Great advice, man. Let's talk a little bit about some of your grappling accomplishments. Um, Not only have you done very well in in BJJ and Gi, but you also went to the highest levels in world championships in uh, FILA grappling. Tell us a little, little bit about what that was and then also pancreation for anybody who's not familiar with that and tell us a little bit about your experience with those oh absolutely so in um let's see in 2000 2005 2006 um i uh i i traveled down to to brazil i i was in rio de janeiro training training across humaita nova Unhao, any every place i could go then i went up to manaus uh traveled back to Manaus on my own, trained in Manaus with uh, Henrique Machado's team out there, moved back to the United States, received my black belt in jiu-jitsu, and then a week later I went to the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu World Championships, um, took first in the black belt gi division, and then went into the open division and and uh, took third in the open. So... After after I did that, then I was looking at I was looking at man, am I what direction do I want to go here? Where 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 do I think I'm going to get the best competition and the best um, the best the best overall game? No gi was really really getting hot, you know. It was really really getting exciting out there. I mean, you got even at this time <laughs> at this time. Uh, Grappler's Quest came out with the first belt, the first Grappler's Quest belt. And uh, everybody was like, oh, my gosh, they're not doing medals, these engraved medals. They're going to do a belt. So I set my sights on that belt. And I was like, oh, I'm going to go no gi, and I'm going to go after that belt. And now I have this belt. <laughs> I won this Grappler's Quest belt. And you should, I should send you a picture of this. I mean, Marty, you should see this belt. It, it It's like grapplersquest.com on the center of the, the metal. Nice, nice. It, it has like, uh, I think it's, it, 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 I don't think it was tap out of the time. It's like one of the off-brand companies that fell off. You know what I mean? It yeah. has a, it's little, like the belt is small. Like they put the metal just like right in the middle of it. <laughs> and then it says Grapplers Quest on top and it has like some flowery things coming off and it's like, it's, it's, I would say, you know, the best pleather you could get. <laughs> anyway, it was, uh, it was the very first Grappler's Quest belt. Now I show up at like Naga and Grappler's Quest. I'm like, wow, that is a sweet looking belt, man. This, 
Yeah, I've mean, come a long way, right? <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, like back back then, brackets were thirty-two man deep. Wow. DJ Penn was entering. Matt Hughes was entering. Frank Mir was in the brackets. Uh, Roy Nelson was in the bracket. That's you had amazing. You had Dean Lister was in the bracket. Jeff Monson was in the bracket. Sean De Hibero was in the bracket. I mean, this was at a time where Sean De Hibero on his on his uh, bio it said Grappler's Quest champion. I mean, this wow. was a this, this is a crazy time period where it, it meant it was like Abu Dhabi almost like in that realm. Like, wow, we're going to Grappler's Quest. It was crazy. So, so I did that. And then, uh, and then after that, there came a wave in 2006, 2007, where they said, you know what we're going to do? We guys, we're getting rid of the moon to y'all. And, uh, they were like, it, they felt that it was corrupt at the time. And, and for anybody who's involved with, with, you know, Mundial, IBJJF, anything like that. I'm just, I'm just giving history of, of a time period and what was going on. Um, they felt like, oh my gosh, we want to get in the Olympics. And everybody was talking about getting into the Olympics. We could, how do we get in the Olympics? Well, there's only one way to get in the Olympics. And at the time, it was FILA. FILA was the Federation of International Lutadora Association. And now the only way into the Olympics for anybody listening who's at all curious of how this is done, you have to go through UWW, the United World of Wrestling. So right now, anybody who's not supporting that, you're not supporting getting into the Olympics despite any propaganda you're reading online. It's UWW, period. So they're, they're the umbrella corporation that controls all Olympic bodies. So at this time period... Mundial, IBJJF, all of that, they, were, they wanted to be a part of the Olympic Games. And there's a video, there's a video, Fabio Gergel, uh, Shande Hibero, all, all the big names in jiu-jitsu, they go, they say, Marty, they say, we want, we want to do Fila, this is going to be the best thing ever, because finally we're going to know who the real world champion is, because we're going to have one representative from every country come to this competition. It won't just be Basically, it's not just going to be an open where you get 200 bucks and who's ever in proximity shows up to the open, right? Instead, we're going to make world teams, only one member per world team. So Canada, America, Brazil, you get one world team member. You don't just get to stack the deck with 10 people at Abu Dhabi and have one from every other place. No, it's one, and that's it, like the Olympics. So we got everybody gets on board, 2007, and literally everybody shows up to the world team trials. I mean, in America, it was like Bill Cooper and Jeff Glover and, uh, Sim go and myself. And I mean, Jeff Monson made the world team. I mean, we're talking like big names and in Brazil, everybody competed to make the world team. I mean, all over. So then I ended up winning the world team trials in 2007 for, for the new stage of what was going to be, we're going to go to the Olympics. And uh, jiu-jitsu is going to be the next Olympic Games. And we go to Turkey to compete at the World Championships. So we leave U.S. soil, fly to Turkey, and here we are at the World Championships. And I'd have to go back to find my bracket. But uh, first round, I, I fought somebody from, like, Iran, right? Former Olympian wrestler from Iran. And I ended up triangling him. He picked me up, slammed me on my neck, but then I just held the triangle. He finally submitted. And then their guys kind of stormed the stage a little bit. And then everybody had to be separated. Then in another match I fought, oh, so like the finals match, I fought John Cavanaugh. And if you know who that is, that's Conor McGregor's head coach. Right. And I submitted him with an ankle lock and popped his ankle. And then that was his last competition. He moved on and now took on Conor McGregor, Gunnar Nelson, and he became world renowned. So in 2007, it was all one representative from every country came together and, and did this competition. And these guys are like the biggest names now in UFC and everywhere else. And meanwhile, 
at any of these other competitions, we got a bunch of guys that are all from Laguna. You're not fighting Serbia. You're not fighting Russia. You're not fighting France. You're just you're fighting everybody from the same school and separating brackets. At FILA, it was an unbelievable new wave where everyone was there. You have a full bracket. I mean, some brackets, 60 guys. From one one from every country. Oh, that's crazy. And it, it was unbelievable. Like I fought Serbia, Canada, Brazil. I beat the Brazilian in the semifinals in 2008 at the. That was a demo sport for the Olympic Games that year. And then FILA fell off because of corruption, and they created UWW. And uh, then all of a sudden, FILA in about 2010 after. I mean, I can understand how frustrating this would be, but, but the reality was is all of these men who got on board and wanted to create the ultimate world championship where we found out who the real champion was, they got knocked off on the world team trials, and then they didn't get a silver medal. They were national guys. You're number four in the nation. Well, whoa, 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 I want to be a world champion. Well, in FILA, there was five weight categories for men and four weight categories for women. That was it. So now if you were to go to, I don't know, the Pan Americans ran by another organization, it's not just five and four. You got all different ages. You got white belt, purple belt, brown belt, black belt. I mean, everything, right? Right. Different weight categories by like eight pounds. Everybody gets to be a world champ. But, But with what Fila was doing, it was unreal. It was like nothing you had ever seen before. I fought, I fought in every country, and it was the best experience of my life. And uh, I, get to, I get to sit on those world championships, and, and I can look at everybody else across, across the board and say, so what countries were at your world championship? And they're like, well, Brazil and America. It's like, oh, yeah, but like, what about the Turkish guy? or Iran, or Siberia, Russia, Canada, you know, the bracket has to be full. So this was like just a beautiful time, and I think we're falling off there. So after, after I competed in FILA, I went to the Pancration. Uh, I went to Pancration. And um, for, those, for those who know about Pancration, it's, it, it was what was in Greece. It was the original Olympic Games. And... Uh, when I went to Pancration, it, it, was, uh, it was just like FILA, just like FILA. Like, there's, no, there's no sitting guard. If you sat guard, that's okay, you lose, but it's, you lose two points. And the, uh, the mentality behind the, that, that point system was, it was very simple. Like, you know what's, if you pull guard on, on me, that's okay. It just means you, you, decided that you couldn't do takedowns with me, so you pulled guard. So you lose two points. I took you down with fear rather than anything else. And you can call it strategy, you can call it whatever you Mm -hmm. want to call it, but you went from top to bottom, it's two. So it was wrestling-based with submissions. And so in 2008, I won the world championships for pancreation. In 2010, I won the 149-pound weight division for pancreation, and then uh, I won the absolute division uh, in in pancreation, and I became the smallest guy to ever do it at 149 pounds. So I saw that video recently. Uh, you at 149, and uh, I think it's Brandon Ruiz at 265 pounds for the um, absolute and. You, you you referenced uh, Master Sauer's fight and the big weight discrepancy uh, discrepancy earlier, but this man that's a lot of weight difference and you uh, man you took care of business. It was impressive. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was it was uh, pretty ironic. I mean, uh, I won the 149 pound weight division, and Brandon Ruiz was on the world team with me in Fila. Uh, Jeff Monson had made the world team. And then Brandon Ruiz took his spot the next year. They had an epic match, Monson and, and Brandon Ruiz. So they, they'd go back and forth year by year. Brandon Ruiz ended up winning the FILA World Championships 
represented Team USA, and he's incredibly accomplished in Greco-Roman wrestling, and, and he's a jiu-jitsu black belt. And he said to me, hey, man, you joining the absolute? And I was like, no, no, I'm done. You know, I'm done for the day. And he was like, come on, man, it'll be fun. Dude, you're, you're moving so well today. I think you should join. And then I was like, all right, I'll join. That sounds fun. You know, I'm not, we traveled all the way here. Yeah, let's do it. So then I got up and I went and put my name on the list. Like, yeah, I won my weight division. So in pancreation, you have to win your weight division or be top two. You have to be a finalist and then you can, you can enter the absolute. So, so it keeps the division tight, but now it's really just the top guys fighting each other. So you can, you can view it. So then I ended up fighting Brandon, who was the former king of pancreation. I mean, obviously he's just, what a monster. Yeah. I mean, technical, his positions are incredible. His arm at the time was like the size of my leg. It was just unreal. And uh, I fought him in the semifinals and, and was able to submit him uh, after I put points on the board. And then I moved on from him and I had to fight Keith Wilson. He wrestled at OSU and now uh, for the last few years, he's been, he's been the Olympic freestyle team coach for the women. He was an incredible grappler, just absolutely incredible. I think he wanted it like 205 pounds in pancreation or maybe he was the 195 pound guy. And uh, I, I attacked low and then I fly and guillotined him and put him to sleep in wow. 25 to 27 seconds. Crazy. I it actually was, haven't seen that one. I'll definitely have to look that one up. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you the link. All I'll right. send you the link. Great. So you can check it out. It's a, it's a great match. Wow. It's a great match. So I, I did that. And when in 2000, you know, that was post uh, Iowa State University, actually. In 2008, when I came home, I went to the World Team Trials. And, uh, and when I went to the World Team Trials and I won the World Team Trials, we were competing alongside, you know, everybody else. We're, we're all uh, trying to make the world team for the Olympic year. And um, Kale Sanderson and Cody Sanderson were there. And if I back us up in time frame, when I was 15 years old, Cody Sanderson. Now, Cody Sanderson, Kale Sanderson, uh, if you don't know who these men are, you you gotta you gotta look these men up. These are the who's who yes. of the world of wrestling today. Period. Definitely. There's nobody else. These guys are the guys. And I, uh, Cody Sanderson, created a a club team at Utah Valley University. And uh, me and my me and my mom were were hanging out. And she's not she wasn't into jujitsu. You know, she's a she's she's an academic like hardcore but like not into jujitsu right but she loves that i just found something that i loved and that's awesome she said uh hey you know what do you think about wrestling like i've been i've been watching you know you guys do jujitsu and it looks a lot like wrestling to me and back then oh my oh marty what do you mean wrestling looks like jujitsu <laughs> and back then it was like a war you know like yeah like I can't believe you say, mother, I look like a wrestler. Are you serious? <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. Those guys are just strong. We're technical. Right. Those guys are just this. We're that. You know, it was <laughs> the Dan Severns. Oh, yes. you believe that? So she goes, just go stop by and talk to the wrestling coach. Little do I know, I'm walking in. So I, I started college uh, at Utah Valley. Valley University when I was 15. So wow. I'm, I'm a 15 year old kid that I'm at this point, at this point, I'm, I'm waiting to get my blue belt. You know what I mean? I've been training for n what? Uh, nine years. I'm excited. I'm, I'm like, man, I'm going to get my blue belt with four stripes soon. That's going to be awesome. And I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, I'll go see this wrestling guy. Well, now this ends up being the co-head coach of Penn State University, Cody Sanderson. He is a two-time finalist in the NCAA, a four-time All-American, meaning he plays top eight. And he grew up in Utah, right up the road from me. And I have no idea that he's also a four-time state champion out of Utah. Wow. 
But I got no idea what that even means. I just know that, well, I know Mark Schultz. He's the Olympic gold medalist. So what? <laughs> well, this, this guy Cody ends up becoming not only one of my best friends, but like, and one of the best mentors I've ever had. But, but he's, he's an all-time legend. I mean, the Penn State dynasty is built off him and his brother, Casey Cunningham. Mm. I mean, it's just unreal. So I walk into this office, guys. I'm 15 years old. I'm, I'm sneaking in to bars, coaching NHB in the corners. <laughs> nice. For other guys, like, I don't know any different. Like, well, they won't let me in because of my ID. Oh, just sneak around the back. We need a corner, you know? It was, it was just a crazy time. So then uh, I go in, I'm talking to Cody Sanderson. I say, hey, Cody, hey, how are you? Uh, so I was thinking about joining the wrestling team, you know, and Cody's like, so uh, do you have any wrestling experience? And I'm like, you know, I don't have any wrestling experience, but I am, uh, I, I have done jujitsu my whole life. And I've won every major tournament in the, in the nation at this point for my age. Like I, I'd, I'd love to, uh, try wrestling. And Cody Sanderson looks at me and he goes, uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> and then I go, uh, well, I don't think you understand. Like, um, now I'm intrigued, yeah. right? What do you mean? No. What do you mean? No. What do you mean? No. What do you like? <laughs> so I go, well, I heard that tryouts are next week. You know, is there any way I could come, come to tryouts? And he goes, you want to try out for the wrestling team? I said, yeah, you know what? I would. And I, and as a lot of these guys, these wrestlers have come through my jujitsu academy and I've, you know, choked them, guillotined them. <laughs> like, like I know a bunch of these guys, like, yeah, I actually would like to try out for your wrestling team. Like, <laughs> I know like, these dudes. I got dudes. this, yeah. Y yeah, I got this. I don't know your entire rule system, but yeah, yeah, sure. Let's do this. You just show me the rules and, and I'll do them. And so he goes, no, I don't think so. And I'm like, we, can, I can't come try out for the team? And he's like, no. And so then I'm like, okay, can I... Come watch practice once in a while. And he goes, We're, we practice in the gym. And he said a specific day. I think it was Thursdays. And on Thursdays, you can sit in the top of the rafters and watch us practice. If you want. Wow. That's <laughs> and I'm crazy. like, okay. <laughs> so, Marty, you can imagine, like, whoa. Top, top of the rafters. What kind of jerk is this guy? <laughs> guy's a freaking jerk. <laughs> <laughs> so I start showing up every once in a while. I'm sitting in the top of the rafters like I'm watching some, <laughs> some NBA practice session. Right. And I snuck in, you know. And they're all practicing down there. And I'm like, man, I could do that. Like, they're not even doing that right. Or they're not blah, blah, blah. Right? I'm just watching these guys. I'm like wrestlers. That's why we hate you wrestlers. That's why we hate you. And um, so then I... I leave and I start, I start finding guys. I'm like, I just start any t anybody who comes in town that wrestled. I'm like, Hey, Hey, you want to wrestle? Hey, do you want to wrestle? No, not jujitsu. I just want to wrestle. And then before you knew it, I had a group and it's like all American, uh, guys that were coming in town. They all want to know jujitsu. I trade them straight across, you know, like, Oh yeah, I'll teach you that. Teach me this. I'll teach you that. I'll teach you this. So in 2008, I go to the world team trials. And so it's been a, it's been a few years and I'm at the world team trials and I'm, I'm sitting there and here comes walking across in front of me, Cody Sanderson. And he's got Iowa state university on and Kale Sanderson comes walking across. And I'm like, that guy told me I couldn't even try out, you know, punk. <laughs> and and I I I'm like just couldn't even believe it. So this guy I was with, he was like, "Oh hey, I know that guy. I'm gonna go talk to him." And I was like, "Oh, I'll come with you." So 
So we walk over and he, they're talking and he's like, he's like, Oh yeah, we're here for Iowa state. You know, we got a couple guys in and, and then my friend's like, Oh, actually, you know, Ricky, he's competing here at the world team trials. And, and he's like, Oh man, that's great. You know? And I go, Hey, we met before. And Cody's like, and <laughs> Kale's standing right there with us. And I'm like, yeah, we met before. And Cody was like, have we? And I was like, I was that fighter who came in, who wanted to, uh, that jujitsu guy who wanted to like get on the team. And he was like, oh yeah, that's right. And I was like, I'm competing today. If you want to watch me compete, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be nice to, you know, have you watch me and stuff. And he was like, yeah, what time are you on? And I told him my bout numbers and I figured they weren't going to watch. Well, they watched, and before you know it, I got a letter asking me if I wanted to uh, join the Iowa State Cyclones. Wow. And, and so then I, I, uh, Pedro Sauer had moved to Virginia. He was now uh, running everything. I mean, he's next to the CIA headquarters. He's, like, training all the schools, all the people, and he said, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to leave you in Utah and uh, – and I need somebody to take over this school and there's nobody I would trust more with the school. So now I got this burden over my head, like, wow, what, what am I going to do? You know, I'm black belt in jujitsu. I'm passing on grandmaster Elio's art that they've given me, but now I've just been offered by Kale Sanderson to wrestle for him at the Iowa state Cyclones. Like, what do I do? So I called professor Sauer and professor Sauer was like, absolutely you should do it Mm -hmm. yes and so i i sold everything that i had everything and boom moved and then before you knew it i was wrestling for kale sanderson that's amazing 2007 2008 and uh it was wild marty it was wild you know that that's such a great story And, and props to to kale both of them for recognizing your potential and and being innovative enough to bring someone outside of like traditional collegiate wrestling into their program because I'm sure they saw the potential of maybe mixing things up and bringing some extra stuff in there you know kind of integrating some things right yeah you know, the thing about Kale Sanderson that makes him so unique is the fact that he he is an innovator you know he's a he knows that it's important to to continuously uh, learn and change things. I have a quote actually from Kale Sanderson that it's it's unless you continuously work, evolve, and innovate, you'll learn a quick and painful less, lesson from someone who has. Mm. And Kale says that every year before we start practice, he he's constantly telling us if you aren't evolving, continuously working, innovating you will learn a quick and painful lesson from somebody who has. And that's Kale Sanderson. He's like, I know wrestling, you know, I, I know freestyle. I know Greco. I'm, and there were times he brought judo guys in the room that's to cool. try to throw his guys. And then he brings, he brings the top jujitsu guy he could bring at the time in. And he's, he's learning and innovating and growing all of the time. And, and I will tell you right now, I, this last summer, so me and Kale are lifelong friends. And me and my, me and my wife, Lindsay, we, we went out to Penn State. And we stayed at Kale's house. And we played a bunch of Fortnite and uh, trained a bunch of wrestling. He is on the mat wrestling two hours a day, three hours a day, just having fun wrestling. That's great. And uh, it's not just what he says. You know, it's just what he does. I mean, if you, if you walked into his office right now, not to like explain somebody else's office, but just to, just to kind of give you an idea of, of the mindset that, that I try to work in and the mindset that the Gracie's worked in and the mindset that Alia worked in and, and something that I see in Kale Sanderson and, and myself is that, that it's, it's less computers. You'll see a doodle on his desk. He's, He's reading books and he's putting hands on people and training and actually just 
going and spreading the art in the real way that it's done. You know, you can learn from, you can learn from a video, but now once you've learned from that video, you have to go put your hands on something. It's mm-hmm. a feel thing. And if you want to know why he stays so far ahead, he's not looking for shortcuts. He may learn something from, from a video and then he immediately, it's like, okay, now let's go train for two hours. He doesn't just sit there and stare at a library all day and thinks, think he got better. He, he's constantly staying uh, in touch with who he is, you know, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And, and that's what all of the greats are doing. Absolutely. And that's what could separate everybody is finding balance in all three of those. So uh, I know that went off a little a little off topic. No, you know, could help. that's super interesting. And, and your life was, was obviously very impacted by that merger and that friendship and that mentorship. What was the biggest impact on you spending that time in that environment in Iowa? And, and how did that affect you as a person, but also your, um, your grappling and fighting ability. Oh, you know, that Marty, you got great questions. You got great questions. Cause they lead me down. They lead me down the stories, you know? Um, I would say that it's, it's difficult to just point at one, at one area, but I will tell you, uh, some things that I have noticed even recently as I watch, as I watch these, uh, these these young jujitsu guys are coming up and it's exciting to see them there's these beautiful styles and um you know the they're they're taking uh techniques that worked for the legends of the past and and they're putting them together in in great systems and and building building this this uh new style of grappling they or what they feel is a new style of grappling um and they, they're innovating and they're working. Uh, and as I watch them do it, one thing that I can tell you that, that they're missing is if you want to learn how to wrestle, I mean, really, you want to really know how to wrestle, you got you to gotta go to a collegiate room. You got to go to a high school first. And you can't, you can't grapple with jujitsu guys and think that you're a good wrestler. You, you can't practice double legs with, with uh, a straight jiu-jitsu practitioner. You need to go to somebody who has 20 years experience and, and then you don't, have to, you don't have to have 20 years experience if you're learning from somebody who has 20 years experience. And then you do it exactly the way they said it. And then you do 500 reps a day until you got it. But then you wrestle wrestlers and you jujitsu jujitsu players. And that is what makes you great at those things. Guys who are wrestling jujitsu players and think they're good, they're not going anywhere. So one of the biggest things that I learned when I was, when I was wrestling at Iowa State University and under Kale Sanderson is, is, guys, you guys think you're good at wrestling. You're not even in the ballpark. You're not even, you don't even understand what it is. A practice, if you make it through a real practice, and I mean from start to finish, that is an accomplishment in college wrestling. I mean, that is like the real deal. And then if you make it through the second one, and then the 10th one, and then the 30th, and then before you know it, you make it through a season. You know, I I think one of my biggest moments was just when I lettered at Iowa State University, and I got to have the same jacket as Kale Sanderson and Dan Gable. That was like, wow. That's huge. You know, I cannot believe I made it. And um, there's, a, there's a very big difference between a real, a real wrestling practice and learning a couple wrestling moves at the gym. Mm. And there's a big difference in how powerful these techniques are. And there's, there's a certain amount of power required to unlock certain techniques, almost like playing some type of wow game or, you know, you have to have a certain level of attribute points before you can suplex someone. But in order to get those things, you have to go through the real training. And I'll tell you, it's harder work than you. I don't even know how I did it now. You know, I don't know how Uh it was. You took it 10 minutes at a time. No, you know what? Wrestlers have my utmost respect. I, 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 
I mean, there's nobody that has the same type metal and just toughness as wrestlers just in general. You know what I mean? If you can get through wrestling, Absolutely. And, and especially in a huge program, top shelf program that you're like you were at it's it's yeah you're just a whole different breed for sure yeah uh, it was it was an unbelievable time i mean now some magic man he was he was being recruited if you know that that is that's david taylor he was being recruited to iowa state he was coming in him and i were wrestling every day and then he ended up at penn state university because right as i graduated my senior year kale took the job at penn state and now we all moved over to penn state Mm -hmm. But Jake Varner was on my team. He became the 2012 Olympic champion. Nice. I mean, you had guys like John Reeder, national champ that year. It was just like the the room. It was like, now I'm looking at it just like, holy smoke. Yeah. Like, David Taylor became the world champion 2018. He's going for the Olympic Games this year. Jake Varner, Olympic champion. I'm, I'm in there. He's like, we're in the lineup together, right? That's amazing. Kale Sanderson, Olympic champion. Cody Sanderson, two-time national finals. Casey Cunningham, our other coach, the first ever, ever national champion out of Michigan. I mean, it was like, who is this? What is this room I'm in? Wow. And now they've won, I don't know, it's like eight out of nine of the last national titles for Penn State. So to be part of that, it's just, it, it, there's no other program. Kyle Snyder just moved over to train with them, and he, he He's the 2016 Olympic champion. This wow. place is it's just truly a, a room of greatness, right? A program of greatness. It is. Oh, Marty, I'd love for you to speak to those guys sometime because it, they just. We'll talk more about that for have, sure. I'd love to. Yeah, they just have so much, so much to share. So we could we could stay on that all day, but then uh, let's go ahead and move on, change gears a little, just so I can get make sure I cover some things. I definitely want to get to the 1%. Uh, before we get to that, just quickly tell us how you started the University of Grappling and then some of the MMA coaching you've done. That was also a big part of your life. So give us a little bit of that, please. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, you know, Marty, uh, the, uh, let's start with the University of Grappling. I mean, University of Grappling has been uh, – it, it's been something that has been being built for for years and years, and it actually, uh, sadly, it hasn't fully fully even launched yet. So, Kale Sanderson, Cody Sanderson, and Casey Cunningham, who I'm talking about uh, in this last segment, they they said to me one day, "Hey, you know, what if what if we put real wrestling in every jujitsu school out there? I mean, could you imagine how awesome that would be? Not not." Not the wrestling everybody's teaching, but real wrestling. What if we did that? And I was like, oh, my gosh, I just think that would be phenomenal. You know, and they're like, they're like sitting back and they go, they go like, you did jujitsu. <clears throat> you did jujitsu. And um, you, you're, the, you're the only guy who's ever been a black belt and then entered the D1 wrestling program. I mean... You, you're the youngest American black belt. You entered D1. So you have a unique knowledge of being able to teach it. And we could put together the entire curriculum with you, Ricky. And then what we'll do is then you blend it into the jujitsu that you learned from Pedro Sauer, Hicks and Gracie, Elio Gracie. And then you have the complete art blended together between Sanderson wrestling and Gracie jujitsu. So, so we did. We filmed it all, and we we built it all out, and uh, and then uh, Kale, Kale, Casey, and Cody they started winning national titles, over like title, 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 and so now we have the entire program, and they're winning titles, and we're kind of waiting on when we want to launch this thing. So it's it's all there. Wow. It's all there. That is truly but, uh, incredible. Oh, it's incredible. And the programming, it's incredible. It shows how to run the practices and how actually techniques connect to one another so that you can build somebody into an Olympic champion. And then how they hit the floor and how you maneuver on the ground. And then how you take your ground game and you turn it back into stand-up. It's like... Uh, the enter the system times 10 it's just crazy wow. it's just crazy and it's been shelved 
it's been shelved for like eight years. <laughs> We're just sitting here looking at it like, man, this is unreal. You got to so release in the it, interim, man. <laughs> you got to release I, it. I know. I know. Uh, I, they just keep, I mean, it's like the Olympic Games come up and bam, we add like a world champion and Olympic champion. And then, and then before you know it, I'm, I'm on the other side and I'm, I'm training up UFC guys and then they win championships and we, uh, we just haven't found the magic time to just drop it into the world yet because, (laughs) because it's working. That's well, that's cool. uh, But everything happens on the, and and it's time, right? When it's supposed to. So I'm sure that's going to be on the horizon. Talk a little bit about some of the, the trainers in the MMA and uh, UFC arena you've, you've trained and what that was like. Oh, UFC was, UFC has just been an incredible, incredible experience for me. Um, to go from a kid and actually at six years old, there was no UFC to watching Hoist Gracie win the first UFC. I mean, Pedro Sauer was in the chain running them out. I'm sitting on the mat watching this, this Brazilian train. I can't even understand Portuguese. I just know he has a fight. And I, we're rooting for him. To then one day standing there in Frank Mayer's corner and then, to sit in Carlos Condit's corner, to coach Misha Tate's corner, you know, to to be with be with the John Jones, the Travis Brown, the Carlos Condit's, the Joe Lozons, the I mean, uh, work with BJ Penn, Anderson Silva, Little Nog. Like I, the list is so wow. big. I I apologize if I didn't say your name on the on the uh, podcast, but uh, I was I was really blessed to. To uh, in the beginning of my MMA coaching, I met a man named Jimmy Gifford. He's in, he's still top boxing coach in my opinion in, in the world. You know, like you know, there's other there's so many great boxing coaches than striking coaches. Um, but Jimmy Gifford was m- my first connection where we made we made a team and we just started training individuals and. And uh, Jimmy, Jimmy, I mean, he trained Misha Tate, you know, he trained uh, Forrest Griffin, he trained uh, Frank Mir, he, he just training champion, champion, champion. And we came together and, and Jimmy Gifford introduced me to the owners of the UFC. And these, these men, they just changed my life immensely. Once again, just so many great men have, have been a part of my life and the, the Fertitta brothers, they, they, uh, they saw my talent and they saw what my capabilities and they, they've seen everybody. I mean, they, they owned the UFC. You got to see every trainer in the world. You got to see every fighter in the world. And, uh, they said, Hey, you have a dialect and a style that we've never seen before. You're the best jujitsu practitioner that, and the best wrestler that we've ever seen. The blend is it's, it's priceless. No one has this. We want to move you to Vegas. We want you to start working with fighters or we want you to start working with, with, with others and start to spread this. So this really happened because, because of this man, Jimmy Gifford. And then before you know it, I'm, I'm traveling to Albuquerque and I'm, I'm, I'm working with Winkle John and Jackson and Brandon Gibson and I'm training their guys. And, and I'm I'm tra- traveling to Boston. I'm flying all over the world, and I'm in every corner. And I look like the I look like I'm like a 16 year old kid. I got this Bishop Gorman wrestling shirt on, and I look like I'm 15 or 16 walking out behind these guys. And then my experience just put me in a different realm. I could walk up and just tell them exactly where we needed to go in order to win the fights. And it was because of these. It was because of I was really standing on the shoulders of just giants. I mean, just giants and just saying what they said, wow. you know, just, just small, small pieces of pieces of advice in the corner. Like, like, Hey, you know, we keep getting taken down they, when they grab your leg, they're, they're controlling it. We need to stop that from happening. Do you know how you don't break? You don't bend. And then that'd be it. Then it's time to time to see if they make the decision. And and these little these little pieces of knowledge that have come to me over over these great men just standing with me and helping me accomplish 
my world championships and helping me accomplish my life goals, I just give that back to the next stage. You know, and so that's that's how that came about. Very cool. What I admire, one of the things I admire about you is uh, you you surround yourself with great people. You absorb their knowledge and really take it in, and you're driven. And then whatever situation you find yourself in, I mean, wherever that next part leads you to, you're ready to fully drive forward and, and um, put your best out there and capitalize on wherever it is and take full advantage of it So and spread your knowledge and, and uh, skill. So I love that. Let's move on to you, where that took you with the 1%. Tell us what the 1% is, how that got started, and, and uh, what's it all about. So 1% Better Every Day, uh, it, 1% Better Every Day, is, it's, a, uh, it's a very important part of, of becoming better. It's, it, it accounts for two aspects of training. Number one, you need to linearly improve. Right? We need to make sure that we are constantly moving upwards. And how do we do that? You know, what you don't want to do is, is treat it like the stock market. You train, you get 20% better one day, but now you're so burnt out, you plummet and fall 40%, then you come back up 6%, then you fall, then you go back up, and you put 100% in, and now you, you, you think you've gotten better, and you're always questioning where you're at. 1% better every day is making sure that you need to do enough to improve in an area that you have difficulty in. That could be flexibility. It could be emotional. It could be relationships. It could be weights. It could be, it could be anything. It, it really doesn't matter what it is. Uh, as long as, as you are taking a deep look at yourself, you're, you're creating a dialogue with yourself, and you're, you're being honest with yourself about where you lack ability. And when you do that, you can now actually take steps to improve. You have to have a diagnostic, though. And sadly, the majority of people aren't mature enough to take a personal diagnostic. But I take a personal diagnostic every day. Mm. Then I say, where can I improve 1%? Where, where can I improve in, in this? But I have to make sure that I put time in every other area. But where can I improve 1%? And usually the easiest place to improve 1% is the place you suck the most at. That's that's really the best spot. So like, you know, if you're, if you're overweight, walk, you know, you, you know, you, you ate your way in, you got to walk your way out now. That's the way it is. And if you're not flexible, stretch, I know you, you can run, but stretch, it, it's really simple, simple things. And then making sure that it's not, uh, you're not going after becoming 5% better today because it's just not sustainable. That's how people burn out. You don't burn the candle at both ends. It's just small, subtle gains. And when compounded over time, Mm -hmm. before you know it, before you know it, you're like, you have a story just like mine. And I'm still very young. Still very young. I turned 34 in April. I'm I'm at the beginning. That in itself is remarkable. Compounding. You've done all the stuff, but you've done it at such a young age, you know. What I like is about the the 1% every day is the um, the simplicity. Too many of us get all fired up and enthusiastic to start something new and just buy it off way too much, right? Overdo it. But you're, you start with a baseline, first of all. And like you said, not, not a lot of us are willing to be honest and truthful and look at where you are with something, especially in your weakest area. So you got to have that baseline because then you got to know how to, where to start from and uh, be able to measure your growth. Right. And then 1%, like you said, 1% today turns into 2% tomorrow to 3% and over a year's time or two years time, it's an amazing amount of growth and development. So I love that simp- simplicity of it. Yeah. It, it's so, so simple and it works like compound interest because as you get up, you get up to, uh, you know, 200%, the, the percentage of growth is not the same. And you get better at, you get better at diagnostic, you get better at seeing where you're bad and you, you just improve. And not to, not to take this to a place of, you know, I've only lived success. You know, it's only always been success. Uh, 1% really started taking off. Um, four years ago, my brother, who was my training partner my entire life. We used to, we, he, the first grapplers quest belts, he, he won the, the Nogi Advanced National Championship grapplers quest belt with me. 
and we trained our whole lives together. And and he uh, he ended up getting hurt in a in a fight. He he was fighting, and he got he got thrown down a flight of stairs, uh, and then. It was it was like a three on one situation, and he got thrown down a flight of stairs and he broke his back. So then, as he awaited back surgery, he was he was going through the process, and we were trying to heal him and get him through the back surgery. And he went to the dentist in the morning, and then he took his meds and he fell asleep and he never woke up. And I found myself in Marty, one of the darkest places I had ever been. I was. The, winning what I'm winning world titles. I'm, I put in hard work. I, you know, I, I Oh, I got to dig deep. I got to dig deeper. I got to dig deeper. It, it didn't matter. I had no control, no control over this. And so I found myself in a place for the first time that it wasn't, it wasn't me. I have no control over it other than he passed. He's just gone. 23 years old. Wow. My training partner my whole life. My parents got divorced. I raised him from a, from a young, young child all the way up, and he just died. And then 1% took a huge role in my life. See, it wasn't, it wasn't just when I was world champion. How can I improve? Oh, listen, you can still work to get 1% better. I was killing that game. Then all of a sudden, I plummeted into a place where no one could solve this. Nothing could solve this. He's just gone. My best friend is gone. And, and my brother, we were supposed to bury, bury my parents together. He's just gone. And then I started taking 1% into that realm. And let me tell you, anybody who's out there dealing with real trauma, you know, like trauma, trauma, 1% will get you out. And it, you'll be the strongest you've ever been. You'll be, you'll be so much farther than you can comprehend. But you have to you have to know that it takes time. But if you just focus one percent a day, I don't care if you are at the top or you are at the bottom today. And I don't care what anybody else's expectations are for you. You need to find people who are going to meet you where you are and help you build from there. And if you do that, you'll find your way out. So one percent has two sides of a coin. For me, it was at a very successful point. And then it was at the most heartbroken, lowest point of my life up till now, you know, I'm sure we'll find more. Um, and that's, and I, that's I really powerful, man. It. Really powerful. It was, it was an unbelievable thing. And, and professor Sauer, I mean, I know he was just heartbroken because little Ty, Ty was my brother's name who passed. He was at class with me and he trained with professor and, um, uh, we grew up in this, in this environment together. And sometimes you just don't have any control. That's true. But that, that is the power of 1% better, guys. I mean, that is the real power. I, show, I like to talk about it because I like to talk about the light, the, the great side. The, everything's going great. You can still get 1% better today. That's right. Everything is going the worst you can ever imagine. And I'm talking from a man who can get to that place. You can get 1% better today. That's right. And... And as you claw your way out, you'll find yourself in a place you just never could have imagined. Better than better than anything you could imagine. And so uh, that's what one percent better is is about. And I I have a book on Amazon right now. It's uh, it's called One Percent Better Every Day. It's a manual built on how to squat. So I then I one more thing that I've done is I went into a Olympic lifting center. The guy's a world champion uh, or trains world champions. His name is uh, John Bros. And um, one day I said, I want to learn how to lift weights. And the owner of Muscle Farm said to me, I know the guy for you to go to. And uh, this is right after my brother had passed. And I said, you know, I'm, I, want to, I want to learn a new skill. I need to get focused on something. So I, I went in and I worked with this man, John Bros. And I said, hey, John Bros, I'm 149 pounds and I want to squat 500 pounds. Something totally ridiculous. And this book lays out how I did it. And what I did was I, I squatted every single day. So like, you know, you see those memes about leg day, Mm -hmm. like, Oh shoot, it's leg day. I squatted every day, 500 days in a row and documented the entire thing and put it in the book. 
and it teaches you how you can get 1% better, and it shows how my numbers change. And over the course of 500 days, I squatted 275 as the starting point, and I squatted every single day, and at the end, I squatted 615. Wow, incredible. incredible. So that's a great book. If you guys want to check it out, it has yeah. more of my story, I'll more, definitely... of, more of what 1% Better is about, and it, it's a great book. I'll definitely put a link to the show notes. Um, to that and, and also to your website. I know that you do uh, coaching and keynote speeches and team building, so I'll, I'll definitely um, put a link to that. One more thing before we close, Ricky, and it's been an absolute pleasure. On your website, you have various products like shirts and hats and mugs. Some of them say 1% better. Uh, one says Make America Squat Again, which I love, but there's one that I have to ask you about. It says, I hate, Ri- <laughs> I hate Ricky Lindell. <laughs> so <laughs> real quickly, what, what's that about? So um, years and years and years ago, uh, a good friend of mine, Dan Hardy, he had a shirt. He had a shirt that somebody had made or something, and it was it was given to him as a joke. He said, uh, "I hate Dan Hardy. Dan Hardy, I also trained in the UFC." <laughs> and um, and so so uh, me and my wife were talking one day, and there was a lot of there's a lot of people out there that they're they're not always the most positive. You know, doesn't matter what's going on in your life, maybe they don't like you, and that's okay. So my wife said, why don't you make like a, I hate Ricky Lundell shirt. And I was like, yeah, that's a great idea. So we put it on the website. It says, I hate Ricky Lundell. And then if you go into the description, it says, listen, you're, it says something like, you're welcome to hate. You're welcome to hate me. I even sell the shirt. It's just going to cost you more. (laughs) And we threw it out there for the world. So if anybody wants to, I hate Ricky Lundell shirt. You can pick them up on the website as well. That's too funny, man. That's too funny. Well, listen, man, it's been an absolute pleasure. A big fan of yours. You have my utmost respect, not only for what you've accomplished and and the role model you are, but what you've given and the impact you've had on so many lives and and still at such a young age. So hats off to you, man. And and, uh, again, keep doing what you're doing. I wish you a long and healthy, happy life, my friend. Marty, thank you so much for your time. I'm really enjoying the what you do. And I appreciate you allowing me to come on your podcast. Thank you, sir. Be well, my friend. All right. Really enjoyed that conversation with Ricky. Man, what an interesting and fascinating guy he is. And he's accomplished so much at a young age. I can't wait to see what else he accomplishes with the rest of his life. All right. Up next is the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. Time now for the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. Today we're featuring the audio portion of a video called I Will Not Quit. None of us ever get through this life without heartache, without turmoil. We're all going to fail at something. Everyone's failed at something. Life is a trial. And trials are never supposed to be easy. Life is hard. It's hard handling the tragedies of life. When you're working on something and, and you put everything you have in it, and it doesn't work out, you lose your money and other people's money. It's hard. It is okay to be scared. It is okay to cry. But giving up should not be an option. And it doesn't matter how you get knocked down in life, because that's going to happen. All that matters is that you got to get up. Because when you fail, you get up, and then you fail, and then you get up, and that keeps you going. That's how humans are strong. Failure is an option, but giving up is not. Find a way. If you believe and you have faith, and you can get knocked down and get back up again, and you believe in perseverance, as a great human quality, you find your way. You gotta have that resiliency over and over again. 
You gotta make a commitment to keep stepping up to the plate and swinging for the fences. Every day, whenever you do what you do, swing for the fences. Understanding when you swing for the fences, sometimes you'll miss. Did you know Hank Aaron had twice as many strikeouts as he had home runs? But he kept swinging for the fences. Most times he missed. But when he hit it, he knocked it out the park. But it's your shot to do what you do. Keep swinging and keep striving. Change is going to happen in your life. Setbacks are going to happen. But a setback is nothing but a setup for comeback. The champions is not the potential. It's not the genetics. It's a perseverance to always show up. Always willing to fail, because in failure, that's part of success. Success is not a marathon of life with just ups. Success is formulated through failures, through facing your fears, through falling down and getting back up. That's what creates the champion. And that's going to do it for this edition of the show. As always, I thank you for listening. Hope you're enjoying the show. If you feel like you're benefiting from the show and want to show your support, you can support us on our Patreon page and a link in the show notes. Please like and follow us on social media and help us spread the word by reposting our posts and telling others about the show. You can leave comments on the website at www.racyjujitsurocks.com. You can also go to iTunes and leave comments as well as rate the show. And we would appreciate a five-star rating, which helps us with our standing in iTunes. You can also leave comments on our YouTube channel. If you have suggestions for the show, please don't hesitate to give those. We always like feedback and suggestions. Okay, that's going to do it. So until next time, this is Marty Josie, and I'll see you on the mat.